we may be stuck with a little bit of cold and snow out there, but it could be an awful lot worse, as our ancestors up here in the northeast could have told you on many an occasion, and particularly if they were around between the sort of 1300 and 1800, 1850-ish, because that's the time that we think of as the Little Ice Age, and it comes and goes in the middle of that a little bit, but broadly speaking that's the bit that's colder than the bits on either side. And there's loads of social and economic consequences, that most of which are quite negative, but there's also a couple of fun things that come out of it, so we're going to kind of concentrate on those. More fam most famously is the existence of frost fairs. Now, most people know that there were frost fairs in London, um, that there were, there were 23 frost fairs in London over a period of 400 years or so. Um, you might have seen a Doctor Who episode with frost fairs in a couple of years ago, if nothing else. And they happen all over the country as well, you know, there, there are ones on the ooze at York, there are ones on the Severn, and so on. Anywhere where there's a big enough population centre and a decent river going through it that isn't um, going too fast, you'll get yourself a frozen over river and a fair chance of a frost fair. And of course, up in the northeast, with the beautiful, beautiful, balmy, temperate conditions we have here at all times, none of that ever happened. No, no, no. Or did it? Well, the first one for which there's good information is in 1740, January 1740, and a lot of the ships were getting squeezed in, packed by the ice, a lot of the keelboats were damaged by it, but the locals meanwhile realised there's something good to be had from this. We can walk on this, and if you can walk on it, you can have a market on it. There are stalls and uh, foot races held and football. Sir John Fenwick of Bywell, who's one of the richest people in the area at that time, had a birthday party for his son and he held it on the river itself and he erected a tent in the ice and they, they roasted a sheep uh, by it in the middle of the ice and also as another treat he got to go on a carriage ride, horse with, pulled by several horses right across the ice. I just feel sorry for the horses in that particular situation. But uh, The river was still frozen a whole month later and by that point it was becoming economically very damaging and the, uh, the coal owners hired 200 men well, this is a lot of unemployment at that point with the river trade stopping. 200 men to start cutting a channel through the ice. And they cut a channel that was a mile and a half long through the ice and big enough for a ship. Um, took, took 200 men a week just to do that. Um, then another coal owner, Henry Liddell, started trying to... Um, sorry, Henry Liddell, one should say, was trying to extend the uh, channel to other staves. Two people drowned and then he stopped. A lot of people who come to the northeast have made mention of uh, how cold it has been at different occasions. For instance, uh, only a couple of years after that frost fair, uh, preacher John Wesley comes up to the northeast. For some reason he keeps, seems to keep coming up here in winter. You'd think he'd have learned his lesson the first time. But uh, in, in 1742 he says, I have never felt so intense a cold before. In a room where a constant fire was kept, though my desk was fixed within a yard of the chimney, I could not write for a quarter of an hour together without my hands becoming benumbed. Pretty cold. Um, you know, t two years later, he talks about being in snow near Spen that was so high that the horses were sinking up to their shoulders in it. And in February 1745, he ends up a little bit poetic by accident on the subject. He's trying to travel over Gateshead Fell, and he says it, that the snow was abundantly worse than it had been the day before. Not only because the snows were deeper, which made the causeways in many places unpassable, but likewise because the hard frost succeeding the, floor, succeeding the thaw had made all the ground like glass. We were often obliged to walk, it being impossible to ride, and it was a great pathless waste of white, the snow filling up and covering all the roads. Many a rough journey I have had before, but one like this I never had, between wind and hail and rain and ice and snow and driving sleet and piercing cold. But it is past. <laughs> I survived. Um, it's not always even in winter that you get that sort of problem. Uh, apparently a few years after that, 1756, according to a, a local diary, there was snow or hail every day for a fortnight in, Ju in May, which uh, sounds a little suboptimal. 1783 to 4 uh, is known as the Great Frost. Uh, a volcano called Lucky um, erupted in Iceland uh, over the course of about eight months 
and it was devastating in Iceland. I didn't know about this till I just read this, but in, in Iceland that year, almost a quarter of the population of humans died between the starvation and the toxic gases coming off it, along with 80% of the sheep and half the horses and cattle. So absolutely staggering. And apparently some of those toxic gases reached as far down that they were actually hurting people in, in um, Scandinavia and possibly even Scotland. But uh, it led to, initially, the hottest summer in hundreds of years, followed by the coldest winter in hundreds of years from the effects of the volcano. Um, John Sykes, historian, wrote that uh, that winter, the Tyne was three times frozen over in one winter, a circumstance never before remembered by the oldest person living. And it's one of those frosts and one of those freezings of the Tyne that is in the um, picture that I put up at the, at the beginning, uh, which is taken taken, not a photograph, was painted in March 1783 and you can see the keels being loaded and unloaded by people walking across the ice, you can see um, you know, people walking on the ice, skating on the ice and falling over um, and we, one of the really funny things, if you look really closely at it, you can see there's a tiny crow's nest on top of the old exchange building because at that point it was regular, uh, regularly a home for uh, crows to raise their young but they would normally start doing it in March, but in, on this occasion that was really not a good idea. And this carries on. It does seem to be a really bad patch, late 18th, yeah, late 18th, early 19th century. It seems to be particularly bad, or maybe it's just the evidence is better, I'm not sure. But 1795, the Antiquarian Society of Newcastle says that the ice on the Tyne is 20 inches thick, which is plenty enough to walk on it. Um, we get some of this from statistics, weirdly, because there is a particular obsessive who recorded um, the, the figures for Newcastle for a long period of time. The chap called James Losh, who was a barrister who lived in Jesmond. Um, if any of you have been to the Lytton Phil in Newcastle, if you climb the stairs in the Lytton Phil, there is a very imposing sort of white marble gentleman in a toga halfway up the stairs. That's James Losh. Um, between 1802 and 1833, he, um, every single day, with barely a gap, he wrote weather data for over 30 years, um, over a million bits of data information. And that's brilliant, because it means you can find out all about the, um, the climate and weather conditions in Newcastle at that time. Um, so we know that in that time, it's, it snowed 27 days per year, whereas in the 50s to 70s up here, it snowed 20 days a year, so a fair bit more. Um, the coldest year, he records, uh, is 1816, which makes sense. It's known as the year without a summer, and it's another volcanic one. Those two are the, the biggest, most um, um, influential on climate conditions for hundreds of years, and they both come within quite a short space of time. Um, the coldest month which is two degrees colder than any other month, January 1814. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this session. Um, it had got gradually colder for a little while until uh, the time became a smooth and perfect sheet of ice, as described in the paper. And by the middle of um, January, it was clear that probably this ice was all right to stand on, but apparently nobody quite wanted to be the first person to do it because you really don't want to fall into that the, if it's not completely solid yet. And on the 15th of January, a Dutch sailor attached two blades made of beef bones onto his boots and stepped onto the surface with a long stick just in case he fell in and had to kind of hold himself up like that. Um, and it turned out was absolutely fine. Depth of 10 inches, no problem for um, people to walk all over and over the next few months there were two periods where they had full-on fairs with all sorts of stuff going on you know, there were at least six uh sorry at least seven stalls just for selling um uh, strong spirits people you know, selling fruits and cakes and their hairdressers there are fires lit on the fire on the ice surface for warmth um the chronicle records Horseshoes, football, tossle by, rolly polly, don't know what these things are, uh, fiddlers, pipers, razor grinders, recruiting parties, racers with or without skates were all alive to the moment. Hats, breeches, shifts, stockings, ribbons, and even legs of mutton were the rewards of the racers. 
who turns night into day, the brilliancy of the full moon contributing to thy diversions until late beyond midnight. A horse and sledge above bridge added to the novelty of the same. And it's a worth, worthy of remark that not one accident of consequence happened, although thousands ventured their persons on the ice. And this this session is going to be a little bit different from normal because there were two, well, one's, one's a poem and one is a song that were uh, describing and inspired by the Tyne Fair of January 1814. And rather than keep telling you stuff, I thought I would just... Uh, read you these these poems out because they give the same information in in far more entertaining a form i will apologize though I, obviously i don't have a geordie accent and that does mean that a couple of the rhymes just don't work but if you imagine them done in a geordie accent then they would so um i'm not going to attempt one because it would be more embarrassing than than just listening to it in the voice that i naturally have so um firstly then there was a poem that was in the chronicle on the subject <laughs> the angry winter storms allowed in icy chains the floods abound and on the time the people crowd as if it were on level ground I'm not saying it's all good poetry by the way the keelmen now lay many a plank to make safe footing on the tyne and old and young of every rank pay them a toll to pace the tyne there's next to rented many a tent and blazing fires the fancy charm where the shivering lookers on soon went and dine and drink to keep them warm wham you see about the rhymes from red hue down to Oosburn quay the rivers crowded like a fair and many a group of people play at horseshoes for a quart of beer two asses on the ice were brought a smock displayed for which a race upon the tyne who would have thought to see such sport in such a place as barbara jack and mutton pies with plump-faced nell and hot black puddings come taste them hinny often she cries believe me lad they're very good uns there's Jack the razor grinder too, rolling his wheel o'er the icy tine. Though he's drunk as Davy's sow, yet he obtains some skates to grind. His Jim the fiddler screwed his pegs while, while stripling wenches round him dance, and bold recruits a party begs to gather laurels e'en in France. In Jemmy Nelson's tent we see a toping party. Toping. Do combine to pass the afternoon with glee and drown their cares in rosy wine. Now turn your eyes west of the bridge, and you will view a sight that's rare. A horse there draws a northern sledge, like unto Neptune's stately car. Peggy Swinney, she, she to seek her mate, made her first passage o'er a ship. But on the plank she slipped her feet, fell on the ice and lamed her hip. A barber, bred in Thespis school, with a new pair of skates well shod, displayed his antics like a fool, and through the arch she took his road. But here the faithless ice soon broke, Upon up to his shoulders soused was he, where he remained till with a rope some sailors dragged him to the quay. A gentle thaw took place at last, the keels are all afloat we see, and dingy tyne late bound so fast, now rolls its current to the sea. And, you know, there's there's some lovely little vignettes in there, I think, of, of the different people and different things going on, um, and different songs being sung and all that sort of thing. I think I'd quite like to visit a frost fair. I think it'd be fun. I think the... Uh, People constantly trying to sell you things and shout out about their wares. I don't think we're used to that anymore and I'd struggle with that. But uh, I think the atmosphere must have been brilliant. So the other uh, piece of art that this leads to is a song. I've not been able yet to find what tune it should be done to, but I haven't been able to see a, an original copy of it. So um, it's published um, in 1816 in a collection of similar Sort of entertaining songs by a chap called William Mitford and it would have been using a, a traditional tune I just don't know which which one it is and it's called Tyne Affair <laughs> and the, the, the first bit is is lovely for you know there are some people that don't want to go out in the cold so I'm going to tell you about it instead since in cold there are some who don't wish to come out while others confined cannot ramble about to those in such cases I'll offer a line while the ice is so thick upon Newcastle Tyne. Jackie Frost, when he came, made the keelmen contrive while the river was frozen, how best they should thrive. When one of them opened a prospect so nice, old Smashley, let's heave out all planks in the ice. I was going amongst the rest, the amusement to share, when pay for the plank, sir, says one with an air. Slipped my hand in my pocket without air a frown, and this knight of the hoodock led me carefully down. 
such soldiers and fiddlers arrested my view that something fell out when away they all flew. Fell out? Did I sway? Why, I think twas fell in, for they spied a gay barber soused up to the chin. There were some roly-poly, teetotum, dice box, while others for liquor were fighting gamecocks, while Neddy the bellman, his bell tinkled on, said a cuddy race started exactly at one. Cuddies are donkeys, if you don't know. All of this fine icy walk too, each bell had her bow, Don skaters cut figures their skill for to show, all striving who'd get the most praise at the skate, from the Member of Parliament down to the sweep. A mariner next went half down, whose paws on the ice went as fast as the cat's when she's kidnapping mice. I began now to think twas a dangerous place, when a keel bully roared, clear the road for a race. The winning post seemed a grand sight for a glutton, for there hung suspended a plump leg of mutton, its rump orange laurels displayed to the view, which cut snapes after winning bedizened his brow. This race was scarce done when another began, between knackneed mal trollop and bow-legged nan. This filly race made the flocks... <laughs> This filly race made all the folks... It's a bit of a tongue twister, some of this. This filly race made the folks round them to flock, but knackneed Maltrollop came in for the smock. Hats, stockings and handkerchiefs still hung as prizes, was run for by skaters and lads of all sizes. Razor grinders quite tipsy with Barnborough Jack and God Save the King sung by Willie the Black. Willie the Black, by the way, is uh, William Fifefield, who's a black West Indian guy who was... Uh, a, a drummer in the local volunteer regiment. So he's, uh, he's uh, trying to get people to join up. Before I came home, I'd peep through a bridge where a man ran about with a horse. <laughs> That's not right. Where a horse ran about with a man in a sledge. I was bidding farewell to this cool winter's treat when in Will Vardy's tent I made a choice of seat. So basically the pub set up on the, the river here. A game at quoits, said the landlord, will finish the day. With the tented pins for hobs you may lather away. But the cords were soon cut, made him sulky and glum, for down came the tent and three bottles of rum. So not to conclude, here's wishing fresh weather, that the poor and the rich may rejoice all together. Let's fill up our glasses and loyally sing, Long live the Prince Regent and God save the King. So hopefully it won't get cold enough that the time freeze is over. But if it does, I say, with masks on, we should be able to go out and have ourselves a frost fair. That's what we all need right now. <laughs> and that's it for today. Slightly shorter one, but I hope you enjoyed uh, a little bit of poetry for a change. Good night, all. <laughs>